Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, Introducing Expert Testimony in Sexual Violence Cases. My name is Emily Thrush, and I'm the Project Coordinator here at Equitas, the Prosecutor's Resource on Violence Against Women, and I will be moderating today's webinar. Expert testimony to explain victim behavior is often the best way to dispel myths and assist the jury to make an informed decision based on the evidence viewed in, proper, in its proper context. This webinar will describe the impact of trauma on victims, including cognitive and behavioral reactions, and will discuss the effect of common victim behaviors on fact finders' assessments of victim credibility. It will discuss the law related to the prosecution's introduction of expert testimony on victim behavior, how to identify experts qualified to testify on this subject, and what the parameters of such testimony should be. Before we begin the substantive portion of our program, I'll provide a few logistical notes. If you have technical difficulties, please contact iLink directly at 800-799-4510. If you're using the internet audio option, we recommend you dialing in with a phone since the connections are often more reliable. Throughout the presentation, if you're unclear about anything or you'd like clarification from the presenter, you can use the iLink hand raise indicator, which is located on the toolbar in the top left-hand portion of your screen above the presenter's photo and to the right of the conference call number. You can also chat me your questions using the private chat option on the left-hand side of your screen below the attendee list. I will share your questions with the, pre the presenters so they um, can be addressed during the webinar or we can follow up after the webinar is over. Today's webinar is hosted by Equitas, the Prosecutor's Resource on Violence Against Women, through funding from the U.S. Department of Justice, Office on Violence Against Women. Written materials, including a copy of the PowerPoint presentation, and the presenter's biography will be emailed to you after the presentation. In addition, today's webinar is being recorded for later viewing. Equitas's mission is to improve the quality of justice in sexual violence, intimate partner violence, stalking, and human trafficking cases by developing, evaluating, and refining prosecution practices that increase victim safety and offender accountability. Equitas provides prosecutors with the support, training, mentorship, and resources necessary to objectively evaluate and constantly re-examine and refine their approach to justice. Equitas staff conduct legal research, provide 24-7 case consultation, host specialized or state-specific training events and webinars, provide individual experts to jurisdictions and organizations, and publish articles, monographs, and other resources on topics relevant to the prosecution of violence against women. Today's presenter is Victoria Christensen, an attorney advisor here at Equitas. Prior to joining Equitas, Vicki served as a Deputy Attorney General and a Special Assistant to two New Jersey Attorneys General. She worked to develop strategies to improve the efficiency and delivery of law enforcement services and specialized in human trafficking. While she was an Assistant District Attorney in Philadelphia, PA, Vicki focused on the prosecution of cases involving sexual assault, intimate partner violence, and child sexual and physical abuse. Her work has also involved issues related to the prosecution of sexual assault of persons with development disabilities, and prison rape. Vicki is based out of Philadelphia. The full biography for Vicki will be emailed to you following this webinar, along with the PDF of today's presentation slides. Now I'd like to turn the floor over to Vicki for the substantive portion of today's presentation. Good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us today. If there are any questions during the webinar, please feel free to pose them. If we have time, we'll address them during the webinar, and if not, I'm more than happy to follow up with anyone after the webinar. The information contained in this webinar is a result of a lot of input from professionals across the country who have studied best practices and the case law, and I want to thank them, uh, particularly my Equitas colleagues, Terry Garvey, Charlie Whitman Barr, and Jennifer Long. At the conclusion of this webinar, we hope you'll be better positioned to make assessments and decisions related to your cases that are consistent with facts and research, have a better understanding that experiencing a sexual assault means experiencing trauma, and that trauma has major cognitive and behavioral impact, and thus our goals as responders should be to avoid re-traumatization and process facts about the sexual assault incident through the lens of trauma. And because victim behaviors and sexual assault dynamics are not processed through the lens of education and training by our fact finders in these cases, we should be working with experts on victim behavior when we're preparing for trial. And even when we're not going to call these experts at trial. This webinar will explain the laws and practices to apply 
when you are going to introduce expert testimony and victim behavior. And throughout the webinar, I will do my best to um, use both the male and female pronouns. However, because the majority of our cases do involve male offenders and female victims, for the most part, I will use um, those pronouns, but that certainly doesn't mean that all sexual assaults are committed by males and all victims are females. We certainly know that is true. We also um, know that the majority of sexual assaults are committed by non-strangers who usually don't use deadly weapons or cause physical injury. And just like all human beings who are responding to trauma, victims of sexual assault behave in many different ways. And we sometimes remind people to think of a, of a trauma experienced in their own family and consider how varied the responses to that trauma were by different family members. False reports are a small minority of cases, so we begin by believing. We follow evidence, we believe, unless and until evidence indicates otherwise, just like we, we do with the rest of our cases. And no aspect of a sexual assault is the victim's fault, period. Some of the research that's been done on rapists and on sexual assault is from David Lisak, who has moved the needle away from long-held myths. Sexual assault is not about sexual curiosity or about boys being boys or boys needing sex. It's not about sex at all. And certainly alcohol is not to blame for it. Many sex offenders have a different worldview or a different view of women or quote unquote certain kinds of women, whether those are in their view, you know, freshmen or anyone younger, or particular coworkers. And thus they process things differently. They're narcissists. And they will use things like niceness as a helpful tool. They may very well be the guy who paints himself as the nicest guy, goes out of his way so that no one would ever believe that he was capable of a sexual assault. He is counting on us to believe that about him and to believe that girls and that women make things up, exaggerate things, and are other labels. Um, he'll be the first person to make the victim or to make you uncomfortable for doubting him, for accusing him, and he'll be quick to blame others and to blame the victim. People still tend to think that, quote, unquote, real victims are going to scream, are going to resist fiercely, are going to immediately seek medical attention, immediately report to police, fully disclose details immediately, engage with police and prosecutors, avoid the assailant going forward, reject any consensual sexual activity post-assault, is fearful, is going to cry. But many of the behaviors here are very common. And in fact, Many victims do not even self-identify as victims of rape. Victim behavior is also impacted by the offender's method of commission of the crime. And we're usually talking about, when we're looking at methods, factually, and when we're also reviewing our statutes, we're talking about force, manipulation and coercion, age, and alcohol. And so for force, Many courts, including, for example, Pennsylvania, where I practice, have held that forcible compulsion includes not only physical force or violence, but also moral, psychological, and intellectual force used to compel a person to engage in, in that penetration and sexual intercourse against her will. And the courts have also recognized a lot of the factors that are going to come out when we're looking at victim behavior and when we're looking at the facts respective ages of a victim and defendant, respective mental and physical conditions, atmosphere, physical setting in which the incident took place, extent to which the defendant may have been in a position of authority, um, domination or custodial control over the victim, whether a victim was under duress. And what this slide is depicting is more of cases that are going to exist when the offender has applied manipulation or coercion. And we want to be looking for evidence of grooming or isolation. And earlier we mentioned age, and that comes into play particularly in cases when where you might be dealing with statutory sexual assault, where the defendant is going to look for jury nullification or a downward sentencing departure, and he's going to be looking for these things via victim blaming. Well, she came on to me, you know, perpetrating this myth of a young, manipulative girl so this certainly is an example of the type of case in which 
we'll see victim behaviors that could need explaining and where we would employ um, expert testimony to provide context. In alcohol facilitated sexual assault cases, and these are cases where our victim is too intoxicated, too intoxicated to consent, and this could be because of recreational voluntary use of alcohol by the victim, um, surreptitious administration by the assailant, the mixing of prescription or over-the-counter drugs with alcohol or recreational drugs or any combination of these things. We often will see victims who will blame themselves for being victimized. But a closer examination may reveal that the offender selected a drunk victim, that he got the victim drunk, or that he created symptoms and circumstances to further destroy or diminish the victim's credibility. And all of these are also things that can be addressed via expert testimony and victim behavior. So not only will the victim's context be defined by the type of rape, those that we just discussed, but it will also be shaped by these things. And so when we're talking about the offender, we mean his influence on the truth, on his, his influence and her relationship with him. When we're talking about culture, this can mean many things. Um, a college campus, family, religion, friends. Also, the broader culture, barriers to reporting, access to services or lack of access to services. The self, the victim, she's going to possibly blame herself. We're going to look and consider her prior history, her prior experiences, and the audience is everyone. It's friends, it's medical professionals, it's police, and it is eventually the prosecutor, the judge, and the jury. This is really about trauma to the victim. This is not stress, okay? Trauma never goes away. That's the difference between trauma and stress. Stress is something that we have in different situations, um, students experience this during exam time, and then after exams are over, the stress goes away. Trauma never goes away. When we're talking about trauma, we're talking about um, experiencing an accident, terrorism, war, a major negative event, a death in the family, and these are things that we as human beings have to learn to incorporate into our lives because these things, these traumas never really leave us. When we're talking about sexual assault, the trauma impacts the victim's processing of the event itself and her ability to communicate about the event. Common reactions to traumatic events, in other words, some of the ways that the trauma will impact the survivor's thoughts, the survivor's processing of information, ability to concentrate, ability to sleep, are difficulty concentrating, remembering things, making decisions, feeling preoccupied, having flashbacks, worrying, amnesia, feeling that things aren't real. And obviously, these cognitive impacts then can affect behavior. We may see some of these changes in the aftermath of a sexual assault. And as a prosecutor, these are the things that during prep, after you've built a rapport with the victim in the case, you will ask about. These are the details. The, for example, I now sleep with the light on. I now sleep in pants. I don't wear a nightgown anymore. I wear pants to bed. I now cannot stand to hear the sound of a car driving on gravel. I hate to be alone at night. These are the things that will help you and help the jury understand more fully the impact of the sexual assault on the victim. Some of these we already mentioned in slide 10 when we talked about the reality of what we more commonly see in sexual assault victims, but we see lack of physical resistance. And remember, particularly, that victims of alcohol-facilitated sexual assault are less likely to resist. Crying, laughing, a flat affect. Um, we see a combination of this. A calm victim who is also unemotional. We see a lot of inconsistent memories, delayed disclosure, delayed reporting, piecemeal disclosure, continued self-blame, and a significant amount of shame and embarrassment. These are the behaviors that tend to have a greater impact on the presentation of our evidence at trial. So the minimization of the offender's culpability, of the gravity of the incident, of injury, of feelings, continued contact with the offender or the offender's associates, returning to quote-unquote normal behaviors, right? That's a coping mechanism. I just want to get back to my regular life. I don't want to have to deal with this trauma. A delayed report to authorities reluctance or refusal or inability 
to participate in the criminal justice process, a recantation, and testifying for the defendant. One of the um, experts in the neurobiology of trauma um, is a, is a um, woman, Rebecca Campbell, and um, she has explained the impact of trauma on memory in many ways, but one of the ways that um, I find is helpful in processing the impact on memory is she says the story comes out often in bits and pieces and fits and starts and cycles back over on itself. Oh, wait a minute, I remember this detail. Oh, wait a minute, I remember that. And often the disclosure will come out in a very disorganized way. David Lisak, whom we mentioned earlier, analogized some of the trauma experience to a zebra. He gives this amazing um, animal analogy. A zebra who um, when trying to get water to drink, is attacked by a lion. And so Lisek has stressed that a rape victim, like any traumatized human then, is left with a permanently altered brain in the aftermath of the attack. And that trauma is going to then leave victims with these fragmented and discontinuous memories. And as a consequence of this, the victim faces enormous challenges in the judicial process because as part of participating in that process, several of us, even if we practice in jurisdictions where we minimize the number of interviews, we will be repeatedly asking the victim to recount his or her trauma and then ultimately to appear in a courtroom where the rapist is going to be. And so David Lisek's analogy basically says that this is equivalent to having that zebra who was attacked by the lion consciously choosing to return to that water hole where the lion attacked the zebra. And in both cases, that confrontation with trauma is inevitable. The zebra only does this because it has to, it's got to get water, but the rape victim then feels like this is a horribly conscious choice that he or she is making a more deliberate choice and this is one of the many reasons that rape narratives will be less clear, more disorganized, and inconsistent. What can also be confusing is when a victim has to repeat a story, and given the process is now available for, for survivors, right, and in many ways these choices are positive, but more choice can also be overwhelming. The particular one we're talking about are survivors, our victims on college campuses, we cannot underestimate that these choices may be difficult to handle in the aftermath of trauma. If we want to be trauma-informed, we've got to start at the very beginning by having all of our responders, our first responders, begin by asking open, non-judgmental questions. So we are not asking what is wrong with you, cross a line out cross and put a line in what is wrong with you. Instead, we are asking what happened to you. We're going to be more thoughtful about where we conduct law enforcement interviews and how we conduct them because these processes are also relevant to the evidence we're going to get from the victim and the behaviors that she or he will exhibit at various points in the process. A victim who's better supported from the outset may be more likely to remain engaged in the criminal justice process, and thus we may see a victim less likely to disengage or less likely to recant. And this is relevant. If you know that your jurisdiction does not engage in such practices, such responses, and you have a victim who's recanting, you might want to ask the expert who you have consulted with on your case a line of general questions about the possible impact of a non-trauma-informed response on victims. Disclosure is often a process, may occur over time, so asking questions in a non-judgmental way, eliciting sensory details may help us get information from victims. And this, if this doesn't occur or didn't occur in a case, not only may the phrasing of some questions be painful, non-trauma informed for the victim, but it also may result in responses from victims that are inviting greater judgment of her, by her, or other such responses. Inconsistencies can be caused by so many, so many things, embarrassment, shame, different interviewers asking different questions for different purposes with different tones, et cetera, et cetera. 
And the neurobiology of trauma, essentially the impact of trauma on the nervous system, on the brain, can also explain those inconsistencies. Why is education on victim behavior necessary? Not just ultimately for our jurors, but for us responders, because common understanding of rape and rape victims is still impacted by cultural myths. And courts have recognized that victim behavior, the patterns of response among rape victims, is not within the ordinary understanding of our average juror. The article reference on this slide noted that if the victim in the case or another witness in the case testified, jurors were more likely to find the defendant guilty than not guilty, except in the case of rape. And why is that? Well, that New York court told us myths and misconceptions still apply to our collective understanding of rape and rape victims. We're more likely to blame than to believe. Jurors are more likely to find the victim incredible in a rape case Courts have held experts should be able to explain these behaviors and discuss their commonness so that jurors can understand the behavior and not automatically continue to process it in a manner that blames the victim. One more example of the courts recognizing the importance of this testimony, and here the court says, uses the word need. This is a need. That is very powerful language. So the literature supports the idea that jurors need education on victim behavior. And in one of the latest states to allow for such testimony, now all states allow it in some form, um, but one of the last states to allow it was the state of Minnesota. And in that case, it was the OBETA case, O-B-E-T-A. Um, the, they relied on the studies that are shown here and others to demonstrate that jurors need this education. And what's so telling um, about the, the studies done by Drs. Ellison and Monroe is that they focus on conducting mock jury deliberations. They examined the deliberations of the groups that did not receive any educational information to determine whether those jurors subscribe to rape myths. And they found that the mock jurors' commitment to the belief that a normal, quote unquote, normal response to sexual assault would be to struggle physically was in many cases unshakable. Additionally, they found that the jurors harbored strong but unfounded convictions that vaginal tissue, so this supports also our need as prosecutors to bring in experts to explain our medical evidence that lack of trauma is not inconsistent with a history of sexual assault, right? So these jurors had strong but unfounded convictions that vaginal tissues are easily torn, which we know is not true, that pelvic muscles can be rigidified at will, and that intercourse without trauma only occurs where a woman is aroused which in the jurors' minds was wholly inconsistent with rape. The study also yielded support for the proposition that jurors view a delayed report as indicative of a fabricated report. This even though the jurors were receptive to the idea that a victim may delay reporting for other reasons. So while jurors were able to, to articulate that these things could happen, they still were, were going to lead to the conclusion that many of these behaviors then would equal a fabrication. So how do we do it? We're going to give you a general roadmap for introducing such testimony on victim behavior and the reasons for doing things this way. As we all know, there are different considerations in every case that you handle. So there are exceptions to almost any general rule. So we are giving you a general roadmap for introducing expert testimony on victim behavior, but you might have a case where things are gonna look a little bit different, and you are welcome to call any one of us anytime to discuss other possibilities. 
So what are the considerations, the pros and cons in each particular case? You might determine in your case that expert testimony on victim behavior isn't necessary. You might have a victim who is able to explain on his or her own victim behavior. You might have other witnesses. You are assigned detective, um, the sexual assault nurse examiner who conducted the safe exam. You might have other witnesses who are able to explain these things, and you might think that it is not necessary. Each case should be assessed individually. So step one, first we have to consider what behaviors we have in our case, and we do that by carefully reviewing our file, all the statements, all the histories, and then talking to other witnesses. Ultimately, what you should be doing is making a list of the behaviors that you think need to be explained that may seem confusing, that may seem counterintuitive to your fact finder. This is what we're calling it. We are calling this expert testimony on victim behavior. You might also want to call it expert testimony on victim responses to trauma. We're going to talk about what we are not calling the testimony and why we are not calling it something other than expert testimony on victim behavior. In most cases, you are not going to call up an expert and say, hi, I want you to testify about PTSD, rape trauma syndrome, child sexual abuse accommodation syndrome. Why? Because your expert will never have met your victim. Your expert will not be diagnosing your victim. Your expert will not be labeling your victim. You are going to call up your expert and say, I want you to testify as an expert in victim behavior in a sexual assault case. So we're not calling the expert as an expert in PTSD, and we're not recommending use of this term. And so as many as you, of you already know, PTSD is in the APA's, that's the American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. This is the go-to book for common language and standard criteria for the classification of mental disorders. The victim, in your case, may not meet this criteria. PTSD may not explain all the victim's behaviors in your case. And if you want someone to testify that your victim has PTSD, well, guess what might happen? The defense might say, well, not only do we want our own expert to examine this victim, we now want to subpoena her past mental health records. We want to go fishing, Your Honor. So prosecutors, we want to avoid these things. So generally speaking, no PTSD. Rape trauma syndrome, we also don't recommend. Um, this is a syndrome that was developed in the early 1970s to describe common reactions to rape. And it was based on interviews with about 600 rape victims. And it was really developed to explain healing and coping stages after a rape. The issues with rape trauma syndrome, while it's mentioned as a possible precipitant of PTSD, it's not in the DSM-5. So that opens up a possible defense attack. What is this rape trauma syndrome? It's not even in the DSM-5. And once we apply the term syndrome, quote unquote, a syndrome, we are inserting a term that some of our fact finders may construe as negative, a suggestion that the victim is ill. And similarly with PTSD, the expert will not have evaluated the victim, and also other factors may have caused some of the symptoms. It's important for us to, to understand more biology of trauma, but we're not going to use this term either. In other words, we're not calling an expert as our expert in the neurobiology of trauma. However, neurobiology of trauma may come up during testimony as many experts, many of our special victims units Detectives and other members of law enforcement and advocates ha have now been educated on neurobiology of trauma. They've received training on neurobiology of trauma. And the bottom line here is what this means is that traumatic memory is different from ordinary memory. There are chemical changes that occur in the brain as a result of trauma. Some victims suppress memories of a traumatic event until they're ready to handle them. Memory loss can help a victim cope by allowing the victim to temporarily forget details of an event. Experts can mention this 
can mention having received training on neurobiology of trauma, but should be careful to stay away from implying any expertise in this area. There are not that many true experts out there on the neurobiology of trauma. So we want the testimony from our experts, whom we are calling as experts on victim behavior, to remain about victim behavior and some of the explanations for it. We don't want to overcomplicate this testimony. This isn't about brain mapping. The science is not necessary for the purposes of a sexual assault criminal trial. This is about behavior. So we want to avoid turning this into the battle of the brain experts. Those brain experts are incredible resources. They are amazing experts. We have worked with a lot of them in ensuring that the information that we provide is accurate. And they can be excellent in some cases, but the overwhelming majority of the cases, we are going to use other experts, other people in the field who do a lot of work directly with survivors. I also want to note that we generally want to avoid syndromic testimony in cases involving child victims. So child sexual abuse accommodation syndrome was also developed in the early 1970s, and it was developed to describe five common stages of rape reactions. The purpose of this study was to improve the health of children, to ensure that children would receive adequate treatment for the sexual abuse they had suffered and wanted society to be able to improve their response to child victims by giving them a framework. And there are essentially five parts of this syndrome that were um, described as the five common stages. And those five are secrecy, helplessness, feeling trapped. So for children, that means accommodating the abuse because they feel they can't go anywhere. There's nowhere to run or hide. The fourth uh, stage is delayed, conflicted, and an unconvincing disclosure, and then finally a retraction of that disclosure because that the, the post-disclosure situation usually tends to confirm a child victim's worst fears, and those are the fears that encourage that child victim's secrecy in the first place. In other words, um, unfortunately, in many cases, we see that a child's mother is disbelieving or hysterical, um, the father is threatened with removal from the home, and the blame for this state of affairs ends up being placed squarely on the victim, or the victim feels as if the blame for the state of affairs is placed squarely on the victim. So the child feels obligated to preserve the family, even at his or her own expense, and the only choice that, the, that child victim feels that he or she has is to retract and try to keep the family together. So in terms of testimony, the issues with calling the expert testimony when we're, when we're having an expert come and talk about child victims is that child sexual abuse accommodation syndrome wasn't intended as a diagnostic device. The syndrome itself presumes the presence of abuse and then explains a child's reaction to it. And the behavioral stages aren't necessarily specific to child victims, right? We often see a lot of those stages in our adult victims. So it's important for us to encourage the experts to give more general testimony. Um, and also we should acknowledge that um, some of our child victims as well as our adult victims exhibit none of these signs at all. So a lot of issues with terming victim behavior, any one of these things that, that we have mentioned. We want to keep it general. So now we've identified our behaviors. We know what we're calling this testimony. And now we need to select an, an expert. And in choosing the most effective expert, you want to look for someone who has experiential knowledge, or there are sometimes experts who are academic or otherwise credentialed who may be good experts. You may find somebody with a combination. 
Look for more than one of these, but make no assumptions. Review the expert's CV very carefully and have a long conversation with this expert about his or her experiences. When these experiences occurred, how long ago, what kind of training this expert has received, whether and to what extent the expert is familiar with the literature, whether or not this expert has authored any articles, and whether this expert has been qualified as an expert in criminal or civil court before and under what circumstances. When possible, avoid using an expert, particularly an advocate from your jurisdiction or anyone who might have worked with your victim or your victim's family or perhaps the defendant or the defendant's family. And this is due to possible conflicts of interest. Laws of confidentiality and possible bias. There are, just like every other rule that we have, there are going to be times when this isn't possible due to cost, due to unavailability of an expert coming from a neighboring county. You might have to work with an expert from your jurisdiction on a case. When that happens, be very, very careful and make sure that the advocate is not familiar with anyone involved in the case. And this is why, really, we want to try to avoid experts in our own jurisdiction when possible. Communications between advocates, between other certain professionals and their clients are confidential. And we want to do whatever we possibly can do to support that confidential relationship so that we are ensuring that survivors can have someone who can support them in that healing process. So to reiterate, your expert will have not, your, not met your victim, is not diagnosing the victim as a victim of rape, knows very little of the facts of your case, and is educating the judge and or the jury on victim behavior. So when you are calling that expert early on in the process, you are going to tell the expert very, very few facts about your case. Very few facts. You're going to give the expert just enough information so that the expert generally understands what this case is about, so that the expert can write a report that discusses the relevant behaviors that you want to focus on in the case, and that the expert can come in and testify knowing a little bit about why he or she is coming in as an expert. There are experts who testify completely blindly. They don't want to know anything about the case. They'll write a general report based on whether the victim is a male or a female or a daughter or a child, whether the offender is a stranger or non-stranger, and then they come in and they testify blindly. So now you've identified your behaviors. You know what you're calling this testimony. You have identified possible experts or an expert. What do you do? You prepare expert testimony based on the requirements of your rules and your case law. You file a pretrial motion in writing explaining why the proper testimony should be admitted. And you want to consult with others who have done this before. You want to try to get other sample briefs. If there is an adverse ruling on the admissibility of this testimony and it's appropriate to do so, you want to consider an interlocutory appeal. And you want to do this based on many considerations in the case, including the impact that the delay of trial would have on your victim. So there are a lot of things to, to consider. In your motion, you'll discuss why expert testimony on victim behavior is proper. And these behaviors are well recognized as beyond the canon understanding of laypersons, and it's recognized in the literature and the case law. Also, this testimony has been shown to be proper and relevant and reliable for jurors. It's relevant because left unaddressed, jurors will be unable to understand the context of victim behavior and will blame victims and find them incredible. 
So here is the federal rule of evidence for relevance. We all have one of these in the jurisdiction in which we practice. And these are our lead cases. So when federal rule of evidence 702 was amended, I believe in 2000, based on Daubert, the advisory committee notes regarding that rule 702 amendment stated that there is a venerable practice of using expert testimony to educate the fact finder on general principles. For this kind of generalized testimony, Rule 702 simply requires that, number one, the expert be qualified. Number two, the testimony address a subject matter on which the fact finder can be assisted by an expert. Number three, the testimony be reliable. And number four, the testimony fit the facts of the case. So when we, you know, reviewed um, motions that have been written by federal prosecutors, they're following that general outline. Number two, the witness is qualified. I mean, number one, the witness is qualified. Number two, the testimony addresses the subject matter on which the fact finder can be assisted by an expert. Number three, the testimony is reliable. And number four, the testimony fits the facts of the case. What's also important is that the advisory committee notes stated that the Dauber case itself emphasized that the factors were neither exclusive nor dispositive. So other cases have recognized that not all of the specific Dauber factors can apply to every type of expert testimony. Some types of expert testimony will not rely on anything like a scientific method and so will have to be evaluated by reference to other standard principles attended to the particular area of expertise. And that's what we're talking about when we are talking about expert testimony on victim behavior. Fry also is not necessarily applicable. And don't concede that your introduction of this evidence is subject to Fry. This isn't specialized technical knowledge. The knowledge can come from experience, right? This is not a scientific lab kind of testimony. And here, the court held that the testimony need not be subject to the Fry test because it was not based on novel scientific experimental procedures, rather upon practical experience and acquired knowledge. The testimony was not so technical that a jury could not judge its reliability for itself. So here's the federal rule for the bases of expert testimony. And as we mentioned in regard to 702, in our cases, we'll be arguing that the expert witness has specialized knowledge beyond that possessed by the average layperson. And that is based on the witnesses experience with or specialized training or education in criminal justice, behavioral sciences, victim service issues related to sexual violence, and that that specialized knowledge that will assist the jury in understanding the dynamics of sexual violence, uh, victim responses to sexual violence, and the impact of sexual violence during and after being assaulted should be admitted. So that witness should be able to testify to facts and opinions regarding victim responses and victim behaviors. We mentioned earlier that you, the prosecutor, should very carefully review your expert's CV before it is finalized and turned over to the defense. Go through everything on there. You might find when discussing the expert's background and experience that the expert has left out things that should be included. And some of those things could be very helpful in the testimony that you want to present to the expert. You will ask the expert to prepare a short report, usually just a couple of pages. And what will the report contain? 
Well, for those of you um, who are looking for a sample, you can email us after this webinar, and we would be happy to provide you with a sample. Um, that sample was prepared by an expert for one of the first cases that um, was done under a new law on expert testimony on victim behavior in the state of Pennsylvania. And that expert has given us permission to share a redacted version of the report, and we would be happy to share it with you. So when you think about the content of a sample report, your expert might be writing things such as, you know, at the time of abuse, there is no one normal response for all victims. Victims have a wide range of responses. If the victim is a child, the expert might write that some children may not know what they are experiencing is abuse. And also could write for adult victims that adults may not self-identify. There are other issues like those we discussed, a sense of helplessness regarding abuse, um, accommodating certain behaviors. Minimization of an, of an offender's culpability, continued contact with an offender. The expert might also include in a report that after a victim has disclosed, there is still no standard victim behavior that we should expect to see. The report can also note that many victims never disclose, never report to authorities, and that there are a lot of factors that impact a victim's responses in the short and the long term. Many of those are things that we included in this webinar so that you would know these are things that could possibly be included in an expert report, right? So we talked about the institutional response to disclosure. Perhaps this is a sexual assault that occurred on a college campus mental health treatment, um, and other things that are going to have some kind of impact on the victim's ability to disclose. Um, and again, certainly when we're talking about child victims, these are significant hurdles. So shortly before trial, you'll want to review these things again. And you want to go a little bit further, and you want to talk about avoiding some things that could make possibly your expert vulnerable to attack. These could be things as simple as attire, and we certainly want to be respective of our witnesses' ability to dress as they like, but as a reminder to all of us, a criminal trial isn't about us. It is about a survivor, and it's about protecting the community. And so if perhaps dressing a little bit more professionally is going to help us be better able to have our jurors focus on the evidence, then that really shouldn't be too much to ask somebody. In terms of other vulnerabilities, um, we want to talk to our experts about their discussions with opposing counsel. That they should absolutely feel okay talking to opposing counsel. They want to avoid inappropriate comments or interactions with opposing counsel, that we're happy to sit with them and talk to opposing counsel. And we want to remind them that fairness enhances credibility inside of a courtroom. So we want them to watch their demeanor. We want to prepare them for cross on the fact that they're going to be asked about possible bias, about their ability to be objective, and that the truth is the most important thing. So if a question cannot be truthfully answered on cross-examination by answering yes or no, then the witness should say so and should ensure that he or she is giving a truthful answer. When you are preparing, talk to other prosecutors who have done this before and read transcripts. So one way to ask these questions is topic followed by explanation. Are you familiar with different reactions to sexual assault? Can you please explain these reactions to the jury? It's an easy way for jurors to follow 
and it might even give you a nice outline for the things that you're going to later discuss in your closing argument. Another example is a delayed report. Based on your experience with rape victims, is it common or uncommon for rape victims to delay in reporting? What are some of the reasons for that? But I want to caution you that a lot of experts will prefer to testify in narrative. And so this is one more thing that you'll want to work out in advance of your trial. And unlike our medical experts, who we routinely have been calling in our sexual assault prosecutions, some of our experts on victim behavior have not testified that often. And so you're going to want to spend a lot more time preparing in advance for their testimony. I want to also take a minute to add a note about cold cases. So back in the day, we might have had cases that were not pursued for various reasons. And remember, many of these cases were processed during a time when education and training on victim behavior was not readily available and where the social science research was still developing and also wasn't widely included in training. So many of these cases may have police paperwork indicating, for example, quote unquote, lack of victim cooperation, or have some descriptions about the victim or the incident that are due to the same biases and myths that we have discussed during this webinar. You know, not ideal paperwork as, as far as what we're looking for in our police reports. These cases may have resulted in a lack of investigatory perspective contributing to the case not moving forward in the system. And naturally, this non-progression may also have had a major impact on victim behavior in the aftermath of the assault, as may have the absence of a multidisciplinary response, a sexual assault response team to support the victim. Now, we have advances in DNA and new investigatory approaches, and an understanding of trauma-informed evidence. So an expert may be able to be particularly helpful in cold cases and provide additional testimony to put some of these otherwise confusing issues into perspective for the jury. And in cold cases, when we're talking about some of these things that may have inhibited a case moving forward, you might want to call as your expert in that case a very highly trained special victims unit detective who can talk about the education and training that he or she has received over time, how different it was back in the day, perhaps during the time when the case, the cold case that you are now prosecuting was investigated or not investigated versus what we know now, what we know now. And I also want to sort of encourage anybody who's working on a cold case where um, you're dealing with some of these issues to reach out to us. We recently uh, filed an amicus brief on behalf of the state of Ohio with the Joyful Heart Foundation and RAIN and the Ohio Alliance to End Sexual Violence and the National Alliance to End Sexual Violence for the case of State of Ohio versus Demetrius Jones, where some of these very issues were addressed. No matter what, experts should stay in their lane, be true to their background, be true to their experience, education, and training, and usually that is plenty upon which to base expertise. Avoid the danger zone. An expert cannot testify about a particular witness's credibility be a human lie detector, testify as to whether an assault did or didn't happen, testify as to whether someone is a rapist or someone is a victim, and the expert cannot testify regarding statistics on truthful versus false allegations. That's not the purpose of the testimony. So you as the prosecutor might want to address these parameters prior to trial in order to avoid the questions being asked, you having to object to them during your jury trial and then time-consuming arguments during the trial. You want to shut down this line of questioning before trial. Where in your order of witnesses are you going to put your expert and why? 
So expert testimony and victim behavior doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's part of your larger trial strategy, which also should include jury selection. So we're looking to impanel fair jurors who will listen to evidence, apply common sense, apply the law. In sexual assault, we're looking to eliminate jurors who have biases against your case. So you're looking for people who are going to victim blame, who will, due to preconceived notions about what sexual assault is all about, look to cast doubt on a victim's credibility. You want to try to gather information about jurors so you can present your case effectively, begin to introduce key case concepts, and introduce your victim to the jury during voir dire. So also think about the group dynamics in your jury. Who, who are your leaders going to be? So when you're looking to try to get these questions introduced, approved by the judge so that they can be asked to the panel, submit research to support the need to ask jurors these questions. It's the same kind of research that you'll ultimately be using in support of getting the expert testimony on victim behavior. Explain the facts of victim behavior from a common sense, very human perspective. Explain that your jury will be hearing from an expert who will testify generally about sexual assault and generally about sexual assault victim behavior. Everyone can, on some level, relate to the idea that context is a necessary part of understanding information. And to what extent, when we're thinking about how to plan for direct, can the victim explain her or his behavior, her or himself? And not just the victim, right? Think about how some of this will be supported by other witnesses. These cases often come down to credibility arguments. So we want to embrace our victim's credibility, explain why certain details are providing us with the ring of truth. And that's exactly what our jury is seeking. Turn the defense arguments upside down. You can't merely have another argument to combat what the defense is saying. In sexual assault, we are encouraging you to go a step further because of the victim blaming. You want to turn those defense arguments upside down 180 degrees. The defense wants you to believe X. In order to believe that, you would have to believe Y. Then you'll put your victim's testimony and the testimony of other witnesses into context based on the testimony from the expert. That's your job. The expert told you A, our victim said B, our detective said C. And so going forward, when appropriate, we really hope that you will use expert testimony on victim behavior as a tool. It is such a helpful tool and in many cases viewed as a necessary tool in our sexual assault prosecution. So take an objective look at your case. Determine which behaviors might need to be explained. Consult with experts, regardless of whether you're going to be using them at trial. Consult with them during prep. And then at trial, if you're going to use them, use them to help place the behaviors and facts into context. You can always call one of us we at Equitas are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week to help you. You can go through the facts of your case with us. We can help you come up with a list of victim behaviors that might need to be further explained. We can also help you identify experts, and we do all of this at um, no cost. We are on call and available for you at any time. My contact information is going to appear on the last slide, and I and my colleagues, um, like I said, are available anytime to help. So thank you so much for taking the time to participate in this webinar this afternoon. And Emily is going to talk to you about um, additional resources and other things going forward. Thank you again. Thanks, Vicki, and yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Um, both on the web webinar and those calling in, and I will be sending out the handout of the the PDF presentation, as well as Vicky's full biography. So look for that in your email.
Um, if you have any questions, please know that we are available 24-7, like Vicki was saying, as a technical assistance provider to respond to your questions, your concerns, case consultation, training needs, that sort of thing as they relate to prosecution and violence against women. So thank you again for um, your participation today. We will be, I will be sending out that email with a survey as well, and I will include the link for the recording of this webinar in case any of your colleagues would want to be interested or if you missed any part of the presentation today. Again, on behalf of Equitas, thank you and have a good day.